Good evening. Uh, we're going to uh, cut this 15-minute delay short because uh, we're almost all here. Uh, Monica Bobako is here with us already, and we've uh, already uh, managed to organize the water for our wonderful interpreters, so all the technical details have already been taken care of, so we can uh, kick off. So again, uh, good evening, and let me welcome you very warmly to a lecture by Monica Bobako entitled Islamophobia as a Technology of Power or authority. This uh, lecture is a part of a public event that is being carried out as part of a two-day uh, research seminar under the title The Perverse Decolonizations. It's a project that uh, our um, center has uh, the uh, honor of co-hosting together with the Academy of the uh, World of Art in uh, Cologne, and we're extremely happy to have been invited to this project. Um, the project itself will be um, described in more detail tomorrow during a public debate where we'll present certain conclusions of the two-day seminar and we'll present more details as to the very project under the title Perverse Decolonizations. And one of the people that have been invited to this seminar of two days is Monica Bobako, who was kind enough to agree, who was kind enough to accept our invitation. Uh, to present an intro to her book, which is, by the way, um, on sale outside. That's a bit of a, an advertisement. Um, but we really wanted for this uh, subject to be presented in a broader context, uh, broader than uh, the context of the seminar today. And I'm happy that Monika Bobako has kindly agreed to uh, give us this lecture. So without uh, any... Without further ado, I give the floor over to you, uh, Monica, and I uh, wish you a successful and fruitful participation after the lecture. Of course, we'll have a discussion with the participation of the audience. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm extremely happy. Um, it's uh, very nice to have the uh, possibility of uh, um, having the opportunity um, to tell a few things about my book in such a, a distinguished uh, a place. I suspect that a number of motives or tropes uh, from uh, my uh, present lecture will be repeated um, or will serve as a repetition uh, of the words that we've uh, uh, spoken as part of the uh, project. But I hope this also will be an impulse uh, to uh, discuss or develop some of the controversial items that definitely deserve uh, a, uh, um, a sort of a broader um, view. The title of the lecture is the same as the title of my book, uh, Islamophobia as the Technology of Power. I will try to explain why the title. Uh, Islamophobia became of interest to me some time ago when uh, it was not yet uh, a phenomenon so very much politicized and uh, focal for the public discourse, particularly in Poland. In uh, the introduction to my book, in the preface, uh, I have uh, um, mentioned Janna Rajkowska project, The Minaret. It was a project uh, uh, which um, was about well, an old uh, an old chimney, industrial chimney, was to be uh, um, changed into a minaret in the city of Poznan. And this project stirred uh, a lot of controversy, which at the end of the day led to a situation in which the artistic uh, installation never came into being. However, uh, Dorota Grobelny, the curator of the project, uh, she uh, um, um, uh, termed something that ha happened afterwards, the effect of the minaret, the whole situation of the discussions and of the meanings that were touched upon. They uh, came into a public debate and they um, showed, and I felt that they were interesting very much. Uh, and I uh, think that the Anna Rajkowskas in this project was actually able to touch on a whole number of different axes uh, of significance, uh, different uh, points of condensation and uh, controversies, a focus, if you will, or merge all of these uh, controversies in a single project. What was very interesting was uh, the minaret, of course, uh, became a huge uh, controversy because it symbolized Islam. 
but at the same time, what was very important was the situation of the minaret, how it was situated in a very particular space in Poznań, halfway between an old synagogue that uh, had been changed by the German occupiers into a swimming pool and it actually was a swimming pool until recently. So it was a synagogue on the one uh, 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 hand, and there was a Catholic cathedral at the other end of the road. And this uh, created a field of uh, uh, very many different uh, uh, meanings, uh, establishing uh, the uh, religious symbols, uh, the Islamic identity, f uh, placing it all into different uh, ties, uh, connections, uh, um, evoking questions about relations with Catholicism, Judaism, questions about Jews, questions about Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Europeans. All of these uh, meanings uh, became condensed uh, somewhat and uh, were also articulated in many different dimensions. And um, this unrealized artistic project was to me like a laboratory, a model that uh, uh, indicated certain problems that uh, um, were connected with the presence of Islam in Poland and in Poznan at that time. So when I began thinking about Islamophobia at the time, which was a phenomenon which was sort of gaining or exacerbating and which was ever more present in the public sphere also in Poland, I began thinking about it as a phenomenon that uh, <clears throat> points to the fact that Islam at one point began to function as a symbol of a generalized alienation or strangeness, rather. Islamophobia um, has become a sort of distinct idiom of a xenophobic hostility. Of course, um, what we see uh, when we observe Islamophobia in Poland, too, is that uh, uh, the victims of uh, the Islamophobic violence in the streets, uh, for example, or the persons who become the victims, uh, uh, do not necessarily have anything to do with Islam, uh, per se. That what is more important here are what the perpetrators uh, actually think. This is more important than the actual identity of the victims. So uh, being a Muslim or this uh, Muslim nature is synonymous to belonging to something strange, something that has to be purged the purified. I mean, our identity, our uh, urban space has to be uh, purified of that. And it is in this way that I'm trying to think about Islamophobia as a kind of a xenophobic formula, which on the one hand is obviously a form of regulating our relations with the strange, with the alien, uh, but obviously too, and um, our entire knowledge about the phenomenon of xenophobia shows that it is, first and foremost, a procedure of a sort, a procedure of establishing one's own identity, defining our own relations in our own community, defining who we are. And for that reason, all research on xenophobia has to um, be connected to with a reversal of our viewpoint. I do this when I think about Islamophobia. Namely, I don't. It's not about looking at Islam and Muslims and thinking about uh, and and trying to sort of boil xenophobia down to the reasons of uh, uh, hostility against the, uh, the Muslims and Islam. What I find more, more important is what this hostility does to us. What do we gain from this hostility? How do we transform as a community? What happens to our identity? How is it beneficial politically, identity-wise? What is the function of uh, these types of attitudes? And of course, when I talk about Islam as a kind of a generalized symbol of strangeness, and when I think about uh, um, Muslim xenophobia, in the book, I resort to the knowledge that we have about anti-Semitism. Studies on anti-Semitism and what we know about the history of European anti-Semitism, this whole dynamics of attitudes towards the Jews in the European context. All of these insights 
and to this sphere, they, uh, to me, are a very important point of reference in our thinking about how this uh, dynamics of uh, making a certain uh, category of uh, people distinct uh, Uh, applies to uh, Muslims. Of course, uh, there are very many similarities between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Of course, we need to uh, bear in mind uh, the obvious historical differences as well. But what is uh, very important is that in both cases, we are dealing with the strange, with the strangers, a group which is constructed as uh, a threat to the purity of our identity, which undermines our own interests, uh, the interests of us as a community. And in both uh, um, cases, there is some kind of an interplay between religion and the race, uh, sometimes ethnicity as well. In both cases, uh, there are also references uh, to conspiracy theories. In both cases, too, we're dealing with uh, contradictory um, descriptions or characteristics of these uh, groups. In the case of Jews, it was um, a perception of a Jew as an omnipotent I don't know, omnipotent capitalist, like a puppet master. Um, and on the other hand, there was this uh, perception of Jews as the poor um, sort of spreaders of the plague or something. And um, similar is uh, similar are the associations with uh, the with Islam. Those uh, uh, who are identified with everything Arabic, Arabs. Uh, a motive which is very uh, frequent is that Muslim migrants or Muslim refugees, on the one hand, they are a group which pose a threat or which or who are trying to draw benefits from the uh, European welfare. But on the other hand, they are constructed as uh, an economic power in the form of uh, Arabic, Arabic petrodollars coming here from the Gulf uh, that could also pose a threat to the European order. So these elements uh, plus uh, a um, certain elements uh, related to history of the conflict with Christianity Um, do also appear in both of these phenomena and are somehow used and played with. When I think about what Islamophobia actually is and to what extent it's dangerous, and can Islamophobia be termed as racism, what is the dynamics connected with this uh, form of alienating a certain group? particularly in a European context, because this type of Islamophobia is what I'm interested in the book. What I found, uh, I mean, the references to anti-Semitism were also interest, um, important to me because the history of anti-Semitism shows, um, lets us see uh, the many ways used in constructing the notion of the stranger what different categories are actually applied. I was particularly interested in the connection between religion and race. In terms of uh, Jews, in the context of European history, it is very visible that this uh, early alienating of Jews, constructing them as uh, strangers to what is European and Christian, of course, was uh, founded on religion. The early anti-Jewish uh, attitudes, uh, discourses, were purely religious discourses. It was a form of anti-Judaism. Something had to happen so that the Jews, so that Jews uh, first started to be seen as uh, a single or a more uniform national ethnic uh, uh, group, and this is how we construct. Uh, Uh, strange groups or groups of strangers and uh, such interesting phenomena are also happening in the case of Muslims. Are they just a religious group or are they somehow uh, is this uh, a religion that they can free themselves uh, from or is this a, a stigma that uh, simply defines them in an unequivocal and irremovable way? 
One of the theses that I propose in the book is that this uh, religious identity uh, is being interlinked with race, and the references to the history of anti-Semitism let us allow, let us understand uh, this uh, dynamics, uh, this whole intertwining of religion, ethnicity, and uh, nationality, uh, and it's uh, similar. Uh, to the situation with the Jews, though a little different. What I found also interesting in my analysis on Islamophobia was that Islam is, um, the word I used in the book was, uh, it was an empty significant. I mean, Islam is a category that means strangers or alien. But this strangeness is uh, understood differently by different people. What is characteristic uh, for or in the Islamophobic discourses is a very strong contradiction of what is Islamic against what is European or Western, because Islamic is something which is alien, strange, and undesired, something that cannot be um, sort of coupled with uh, European or Christian. It is a... Um, construction which is very much against or contradictory to what we know from history, this integral um, sort of intertwining, intermingling with what is European, that the presence of Islam here in Europe um, means a constitutive element uh, for Europeanness. And we're not only talking about um, immigrants and the children, grandchildren of immigrants, but we're also talking about uh, the original sort of native European uh, uh, Muslims uh, from the Balkans, or for example, the European Tartars. So the examples of the intermingling, intertwining, interconnections of uh, what is European and what is Muslim are quite abundant. But the construction, this Islamophobic construction, it does assume that these are separate things, separate civilizations, separate orders, separate essences. But the fact is, that this binary uh, structure, which is very strong, it uh, functions uh, differently depending on the anti-Muslim narratives, something that I also try to show in my book when we talk about this void or empty significant. I mean, uh, Europe has to be defended against Islam uh, in according to the Islamophobic uh, ideas, but Europe, which uh, needs uh, defense, means uh, very many different things, just as Islam needs very many different things. And for that reason, I draw a distinction between two sort of variations. This is sort of an analytical exercise because these Islamophobic uh, arguments, they uh, are also interpermeable. Uh, there is no uh, absolute purity of this division, obviously, but I do draw a distinction between an Islamophobia that I would call progressive and an Islamophobia that I would call conservative. In some, um, according to some ideas, uh, Europe is talked about as a synonym, as a synonym of a, uh, um, a lay uh, state liberal, etc. And in such a context, Islam is constructed as an absolute opposition, that there's a, no understanding for de, 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 um, democracy, no respect for individual autonomy, uh, no possibility of understanding the um, the principle of, uh, of, of uh, 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 a lay state. But there are also other ideas, other constructions of this strangeness, str strangeness of Islam. And that means Islam, which is being opposed to Europe, a Europe which is understood as a conservative vision of tradition, Christian or Judeo-Christian tradition, in which uh, we talk about values, the integrity of a community, and the need to maintain the purity of the identity of the community. It's a very conservative vision in which Islam is, or the world of Islam, is uh, a uh, religious uh, competitive universe of a very strange religious value, something that can never be made compatible and that could uh, potentially pollute this uh, Europeanness uh, defined in this conservative manner.
uh, the, these are different Islams and different Europes that need to be defended. In light of that, and I do underscore that um, the Islamophobia that we are dealing with right now, which is the most pronounced, the one that is um, most aggressive and uh, which uh, is expressed uh, through violence against immigrants in the streets. It's a conservative um, Islamophobia uh, that is intertwined with nationalistic uh, tendencies. But when I started dealing with Islamophobia, the major intellectual challenge or problem were all those narratives uh, that uh, from the position of enlightenment on the enlightened um, had those engage in uh, the um, concept of uh, progress and emancipation could not handle or deal with um, uh, the issue of Islam, how to think about Islam, and at the same time, and uh, not to um, stigmatize uh, a minority that is already um, excluded. Um, Mm, I must say that this is complex and there is no single um, uh, recipe that could be applied. But um, I must say this is a controversial uh, issue. We are seeking, uh, looking for a language that would enable us how to construct a um, uh, diverse um, uh, society comprising also religious minorities um, with uh, religious identities. Uh, turn out to be oppressive, um, how to relate to this. And uh, so re reflecting on how to approach this issue, I, in my book, uh, try to uh, highlight a certain approach to take a few steps back and to actually consider, uh, reflect on how did it come about uh, that issues pertaining to religious or religious cultural identity had become such a central topic in public discourse, that Islam had become such a um, major political issue or problem. So I do believe that a historical perspective is useful if we turn back a few decades uh, ago and uh, really pose a question. When was it that we see in public discourse in uh, the Western countries uh, the problem of Islam? Where does Islam uh, is uh, raised as a public problem? In my book, I highlight, uh, and uh, well, uh, I, the, most often this is associated uh, with 11 September 2001 when the public discourse uh, really uh, is very much uh, uh, underscoring the threat um, coming from the Islam world. But when we start speaking about Islamophobia, when do we begin to recognize uh, Islam as a threat uh, in public discourse? Uh, different authors will uh, place this at different times. But nonetheless, um, uh, the decisive period is the turn of the 80s and 90s. The notion, the concept of Islamophobia is uh, becoming part of uh, social studies and uh, the language of social reports in the 1990s. And uh, what's also quite important is uh, that it comes together with analysis. A focus on anti-Semitism. And I do uh, focus on the turn of the late 80s, uh, early 90s, 90s, because uh, this is uh, the uh, what I call uh, the uh, invention of Muslims in Europe. The Muslims in Europe uh, have become the social actor uh, that is uh, uh, separated out and uh, uh, viewed as a player in a, a whole landscape of uh, social issues and problems. And when you, when I began to actually think about this, when I started dealing with Islamophobia, one of the questions was, how does it happen that a very diverse uh, um, groups of people which uh, originate from different corners of the world, uh, speaking different languages, uh, belonging to different social strata, uh, belonging, in fact, to very diverse uh, cultures. Oftentimes, 
uh, these people are um, in coming from a different social context that are in juxtaposition to each other. And then at one point in time, in spite of the immense differences, and they are all um, turned into one um, bag and are beginning to be classified as Muslims. And the label Muslim has become uh, this dominant uh, trade. Uh, overwhelming, nothing else counts. A group uh, that uh, socially becomes defined by the religion. One ought to really ask, how does it happen about? Why do we consider this to be so obvious and transparent? And what does it mean to be Muslim? Oftentimes, these questions aren't even asked. We Muslims are Muslims. All of them are the same. Uh, the religion has specific parameters. and. Uh, uh, this determines their behavior. And for that reason, either they're interesting or they're viewed as a threat, or um, usually they are to have difficulty in assimilating in society and do not fit in what we term as European. But uh, this great, diverse group of people put into this one category is often then stigmatized. And uh, I believe uh, that one needs to really try to address this by really reflecting how did it happen about that Islam started functioning as the civil of uh, uh, strangeness, of being other. And uh, um, how do we channelize uh, this, uh, this uh, regard, uh, this fear, uh, this uh, disrespect for this uh, um, uh, category? And uh, trying to find an answer uh, for to the, how this process came about. I go back to uh, the 1980s, or a key turn of the 1980s, early 1990s, because most of the authors agree that at, it was at that time that uh, some processes came about that I call the invention of Muslims in Europe. Uh, and the label of uh, Muslim uh, started uh, playing such an important role. And I do believe that this needs to be placed in a certain context uh, in order to be able to understand uh, the dynamic of the process. The 1980s in the West, um, the key context for that is development of neoliberal policies. And uh, in this is the time of uh, Reagan in Europe, Margaret Thatcher. So there is a certain uh, refocus in uh, the sphere of economics, the social reality changes at the end of the Cold War. So a certain geopolitical reorientation uh, that is also ch linked to a change in narrative in terms of what's happening to the world. And these uh, um, elements are also meaningful. And I do uh, uh, also stress and that what happens at that time is something that really has um, fundamental consequences for the emergence of Islamophobia. And this is really a time of departure from uh, the narrative, uh, which is left-wing redistribution focus, where social justice was underscored, where um, class relations uh, were um, um, topical and those material dimension of things. What becomes visible is a progressive uh, culturalization of a public discourse. And uh, this is something that is also um, recognized uh, by left uh, theoreticians when speaking about left when thinking that there's an uh, enhanced interest in cultural and identity related aspects uh, that uh, the class relations and uh, matters pertaining to redistribution of goods and social justice. Um, that take a sort of a back burner, and uh, the cultural identity related issues have uh, become um, in, uh, part of the uh, language of uh, the left wing. So what is also uh, recognized is that uh, this uh, cultural uh, reorientation is um, functional to the economic transformation that is occurring. Uh, because uh, uh, we do not uh, sort of create the issue of uh, social uh, inequalities, uh, the measures of uh, identity, uh, religion, and culture uh, become um, uh, issues in the foreground. So the identity, uh, cultural, religious uh, membership are becoming an idiom uh, where a social conflict is expressed, uh, which underscore social problems. All of these matters and items 
and the main language which expresses social tension has become very much entwined with the questions of identity. And I do speak about this because it is within this background and within this period of time that we recognize and we notice that uh, a membership of uh, a group, your culture, your identity, uh, begins to play a very important role at that time. And uh, in, on this canvas, um, there are Muslims, which are then begin to recognize as a separate group. In my book, I refer to a Danish researcher who speaks about uh, the process using himself as an example or case in point and, and uh, relating to the public discourse in Denmark. And I, this person, uh, this author was an emigre in Denmark. And even though um, he had arrived in the West as a left-wing atheist, as an outcome of well, the changes in the 1980s and the 1990s, he began to be identified and to identify himself in relation to his Muslim roots. And he in stresses that there was something that occurred in the public discourse and that minorities were no longer defined in terms of their um, uh, place, in terms of division of labor, but they were defined through their cultural religious uh, um, uh, identity. Uh, some workers, uh, uh, organizations in Denmark initially were, um, for example, defined that they're, for example, Turkish or uh, those from Morocco. But as an outcome of this process that I'm trying to define, uh, the, um, the point of reference uh, for also political and organizational motivation was religious uh, belonging. So something happened in the public discourse uh, that religion and religious identity had started playing a very important role. And I do stress this uh, because at the turn of the 1980s, early 1990s, is a time of uh, quite uh, important and uh, developments. Uh, um, uh, Rajdi's uh, book of uh, also had uh, triggered uh, this uh, process. Uh, so um, this is, was um, a possibility of also defining a certain groups uh, through the Islamic um, religion. So some groups came to really understand that foremost of all, they are Muslim. Uh, 1989 is also in the beginning of uh, the scarf in France, uh, where all of a sudden, um, in the hardware became a public discourse. Uh, how do you identify yourself as being a Muslim? And uh, um, uh, within this uh, affair in France, uh, it became quite obvious, quite clear that on the one hand, um, the, uh, some post-immigrant uh, minorities were defined through their belonging to uh, the Muslim religion and um, in a way that was also a way of rebel, rebellion. Uh, um, women, uh, young girls who came um, uh, wearing uh, their scarves uh, and uh, they breaching uh, this uh, um, uh, secular um, uh, concept of society and uh, was an um, um, overt expression of uh, the Islamic belonging um, uh, uh, group that has been marginalized. Um, so uh, this could be a process of uh, trying to come up with Muslims in Europe, that to being Muslim in Europe we seem so important. Those who before they're uh, Algerian, Moroccan, Pakistani, now become Muslims. And it's a process uh, that uh, can be diagnosed at that point in time and it needs to be also uh, taken into account when speaking about the change in public discourse. So for me, this focus on Muslims uh, needs to be, this discussion needs to be shifted from a question, how do we respond to Muslims? Because Islam is this, that, and that. And Islam is a problem for mm, various reasons. And this analysis needs to be shifted Somewhat, and we need to really reflect on why do we actually focus on uh, the cultural and religious identity? How did it come about that this became such an important axis of the problem? So um, uh, here we see a shift, a change in um, attitude if we do also take this as a starting point. 
When I think about Islamophobia, um, the uh, developments of the 80s and 90s have become very pivotal. Things also happen afterwards, and, but um, all of them are uh, united, if you will. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Islamophobia is connected with the developments of the last uh, decade, how we perceive a social reality, what is the dynamics. Uh, in relation to minorities and how Islamophobia needs to be connected uh, to the economic um, uh, situation in Europe. And it becomes quite obvious uh, that you need to uh, try to uh, combine analysis of Islamophobia with a very specific uh, in conditions of the last uh, tens of years. But Islamophobia, its uh, sort of power um, uh, and strength is derived from uh, also drawing on a very uh, deeply rooted um, ideas about um, uh, Islam and Muslims, which is part of the orientalistic discourse. And this needs to also be taken into account because the image, the perception of uh, the uh, others, uh, non-Europeans, is also uh, important. Um, other orientalistic discourse. Uh, turn out to, to be a basis uh, that um, hinders uh, thinking. Uh, once a minority is uh, defined uh, through religion, when religion becomes to play such an important role, then uh, what, uh, it turns out that what has been so uh, deeply rooted in European history, culture, and uh, um, knowledge, that this actually um, makes a discussion on the non-European others so much more difficult. And we need to speak about Orientalism, because Orientalism, uh, this um, imagination that we have on the non-European others, um, those who are Oriental, uh, those connected with Islam, uh, something that is analyzed by Edward Said, uh, but also many other authors, uh, underscore the fact uh, uh, that a uh, certain imagination, idea of uh, Islam, the Orient, the East, was a um, component of building the Occidental um, uh, identity. So we have some certain uh, schematic thinking that is very permanent. When the West was imagined as uh, the oasis of progress, history, uh, respect for individualism and autonomy, human rights, uh, rationalism, uh, development of knowledge and uh, the Orient, uh, the East, and I do simplify this, uh, was uh, defined as something that is uh, leaves us outside of history, sort of uh, frozen. Uh, um, uh, with uh, out respect for autonomy, individualism, uh, rational collectivism, and backwardness. As Edward Said uh, and other authors have shown, these things were also needed to justify the European presence in the colonies because uh, they simply fueled the argument that these colonies had to be improved, brought up to a higher civilized level. So this was the function of these narratives. But what is uh, important and problematic to me is how the European knowledge about Islam is based on such stereotypes. Even the knowledge that is supposed to be academic and scholarly. It supports the way that Islam is seen as something that never changes, that's something which is homogenous, that's something which uh, has to exhaustively and to totally define certain communities, peoples, groups, something which is uh, absolutely alien and something that can simply not be connected with uh, Europe and Europeanness and uh, r resorting or quoting Quran and when we talk about the specificity of the Muslim uh, minorities, Muslim uh, mentality, that it all 
presumably stems from kind of a DNA, which is inscribed in the Quran, continuously going back to the text and looking at this uh, absolute, infinite, constant character of uh, Islam. And it's all of this which is reproduced also in our language. It's a motif which is ever-present and which fuels a certain type of anti-Muslim um, xenophobia, which also shows that uh, struggle against anti-Muslim prejudice is not just a question of a fighting a spontaneous uh, xenophobic attitudes in politics, but it, it also has to involve a certain criticism of uh, knowledge. It has to be more deeply inscribed in European culture and the European language uh, that was used to, to code the otherness of Islam. To me, that is a problem. How to get rid of these uh, broader, uh, however, automatic reactions to seeing and perceiving the uh, Muslim Others And here, uh, let me uh, again go back to this uh, division into the progressive uh, and conservative Islamophobia, just how strong these erections are. Even if we do not want to be xenophobic or racist, the basic uh, group of rules that we follow, it's uh, something totally different. Um, we think in a quality uh, manner, emancipat emancipatory manner, trying to empower people. And this uh, sort of automatic perception of people from outside of Europe, particularly Muslims, is very oftentimes reproduced in the standard uh, perception where Islam is uh, this uh, a universal, self-obvious metaphor of oppression, first of all. To me, the foundation on which I analyze this, or the basis on which I analyze this, uh, is uh, composed of uh, very many different feminist statements that often uh, draw or use uh, this uh, notion of Islam as uh, something which is, uh, by essence, uh, anti-woman, anti-feminist. Islam is this uh, paradigmatic uh, form of anti female oppression. This um, language is present in many different uh, feminist uh, um, discourses. It's uh, visible in France. It's also visible in other uh, uh, European uh, countries in which it seems that there is no possibility of uh, compromising the feminist uh, language with a language which would not be anti-Islamic. And that also applies to our Polish context. It's uh, interesting to me to that effect that we do have an Islamophobia pretty much with no Muslims. This Islamophobia is uh, or functions somewhat differently. It's not that it's a language that expresses a real or real social problems. For example, how to regulate the presence of a religion in the public sphere. We don't have these problems because we have a very, very small Muslim community in Poland. But the anti-Islamic language also in the feminist narratives is very much present. And in my book, of course, I write that uh, on the one hand, uh, people such as uh, Oriana Falaci or other uh, such uh, cult figures who are quite anti-Islamic. But uh, what is interesting to me is that this anti-Islamic language appears in Poland, and it is generally intertwined with uh, the feminist criticism of a religious traditionalism, which in our Polish variant is uh, very much connected with the presence of the uh, political Catholicism in the public sphere. If we look or listen to the different uh, feminist statements in which uh, these references to Islams appear, whether it's uh, words uh, by Magdalena Schroda or 
words uh, that we hear during the Congress of Women. So different feminist statements uh, which uh, show the anti-female, anti-woman uh, consequences of introducing religion to the public sphere. And Islam is often used as the case in point. Um, something that could serve as a reference point, if you will, or a parallel to Catholicism. Islam is a metaphor, it's a comparison, so as to strengthen um, and force the criticism, to show that uh, the uh, Catholics uh, here are like the um, Islamists. Uh, it's kind of a, of course, we could see this as a rhetorical strategy, but what I found problematic is that this rhetoric was constantly used in a situation in which uh, we began to have an, uh, uh, a, an ever more intense uh, hostility uh, against the Muslims in the public discourse, not to mention the violence. So it's also a question about so it's all a question about the section of metaphors. Uh, an interesting example to me of an automatic use of these orientalistic uh, stereotypes were the comparisons drawn completely devoid of reflection, comparisons uh, of, uh, for example, comparison of the uh, uh, possibility of a new anti-abortion law. During the Congress of uh, Women, what was said was that uh, uh, this uh, type of policy was, for example, during the Vichy regime or in the Romanian uh, 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 communist state and also in Islamic states. Yes, Islamic state uh, presented here is an example as a country or countries uh, of absolute backwardness. If we actually take a look at the uh, regulations, uh, anti-abortion regulations in Muslim countries, I mean, these uh, regulations are very diverse. Out of 40-something countries, it turns out that in 10 countries, uh, abortion is actually uh, allowed on demand. Uh, in many countries, of course, it's banned, and on the whole, the uh, um, uh, legislation is rather conservative. But in countries such as Tunisia, um, uh, abortion was made legal before it was made legal in the United States, Germany, or France. So the actual uh, state of affairs is a lot more complex, which doesn't mean that it's also totally optimistic. But what I'm trying to say is that we oftentimes use very different sort of stereotypical, sort of ad hoc, automatic uh, references. And, uh, and and it's and, and this is done by a uh, by 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 people who do not want to to um, to, to duplicate or to um, or to repeat uh, prejudices. What I'm trying to say is that a certain um, sort of assumed strangeness uh, related to what is Islamic is unfortunately embedded in this uh, reservoir of uh, uh, terms, concepts, and discourses uh, that we have, and is oftentimes left uh, unproblematized. Unpro Though, obviously, what we're dealing with is uh, this Islamophobia that I call conservative, which is uh, interlinked with uh, a policy of uh, op policy openly excluding and uh, 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 nationalistic. And in this uh, uh, context, uh, Islamophobia uh, links up or is connected with other types of uh, phobias, such as anti-Semitism, be it uh, the Jews or the Arabs, the Muslims. They're the ones who have uh, no place, for whom there is no place in our community. I generally have noticed that we are dealing with a process of learning. The fact that in Poland, we've not ever had the need or necessity to actually think about our attitude to uh, Muslims or to Islam. We have not uh, ever really been uh, put in a situation in which uh, this would uh, be a problem or an issue. Uh, in 2015, it definitely accelerated this whole process of learning, and I feel that this is, um, or this knowledge about Islam and the dynamics uh, related to migration, this whole s refugee situation, this knowledge is much broader than what we had before, that under this uh, level of official 
and you know xenophobia uh, something very important was happening some kind of a process of learning of education of acquiring knowledge a process also of rethinking metaphors uh, that we're using and also sometimes our instinctive uh, uh, ways of addressing uh, the all sorts of different uh, others and that is uh, definitely happening but uh, what is also interesting to me and something that I also um, indicate in my book is that this Islamophobia of ours without the Muslims, something that we're dealing with in Poland, that it's um, an element, I mean, it cannot be boiled down to we versus the Muslims, that this is all happening uh, someplace else. Uh, and it's uh, very clearly visible when we take a look at uh, the nationalist uh, uh, right-wing uh, xenophobia, that it is a part of a broader discourse, uh, which uh, can be termed as rebellion against uh, the European center, or generally a part uh, of a sort of particular affirmation of a national uh, identity in opposition to a certain project, in opposition to the domination of the European Union, domination of Germany, etc., etc., uh, which, uh, and to a large extent, I mean, it's a it's a part of a broader package, ideological package, namely this reluctance to uh, uh, the Muslims is a part of a broader narrative, which also leads to a number of different paradoxes in this narrative. As, because, we don't, because we hate the Muslims. I mean, we hate the Muslims because uh, they were supposed to have been imposed on us as refugees by the colonial European Union who wanted to limit uh, our national sovereignty and somehow violate our cultural autonomy of the Polish people, its a Catholic identity. Uh, and um, so this uh, backlash, if you will, uh, is aimed at Islam as something strange, but also at a certain model of Europeanness, which is uh, based on things like equality of sexes, uh, uh, gender, or the whole, you know, the the, the uh, democracy and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So. And for that reason, we have to deal with such paradoxes as, on the one hand, Islam is hated here, but at the same time, as part of the package, we are rejecting, for example, the gender uh, idea or ideology that Islam is gender because uh, the European Union imposes us, uh, imposes on us uh, the um, uh, convention anti. Uh, 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 anti-violence uh, uh, convention, I mean, violence against women convention, plus the Islamic uh, or uh, Muslim refugees. So it's like all the same thing that uh, will be fighting both the gender ideology and Islam. And Islam and gender is like going to come out as one thing. So, and you can see this very clearly that Islamophobia doesn't have an autonomy. It's like not an autonomous fact. Well, true, uh, specific Muslims, uh, individual Muslims, they suffer from this xenophobic energy that then translates into violence and the feeling of insecurity into stigma, stigma, stigmatization and building a certain public uh, space in which, um, um, which is not friendly uh, for the Muslims. But at the same time, at the same time, these are all sort of ideological uh, combinations that are filled with all of these paradoxes. And trying to untangle these paradoxes uh, is, is, is very, uh, I believe, uh, important. I have uh, probably just set out perhaps uh, just several um, major tropes uh, included in the book. And with that, I would like to finish and hope that you have some comments and uh, questions, or perhaps uh, um, you would like to disagree uh, with uh, some of the uh, opinions that I've presented. Thank you very much uh, for your very insightful presentation.
And I would now like to open the floor of discussion. And please uh, raise your hand. I'll come over with the mic. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, extraordinary lecture. What I particularly liked is the combination of this uh, intensified Islamophobia or the appearance of Islamophobia as a problem with the uh, paradigm of uh, describing uh, society in a class-based uh, 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 a system and the material conflicts. I think that this is key to the many different problems that we're dealing with today, for example, populism. And in this spirit, I would like to ask you one thing. I don't know the book yet, so I don't know whether you've actually touched on it in your in your publication, what do you, how do you see the role of the new Polish uh, uh, migration diaspora in places like the UK in creating the Islamophobic discourse in Poland? I'm not talking about this classical problem, which is described that we sort of uh, transmit our experience of being rejected and humiliated, that we transmit it onto others that come to Poland. I'm talking about uh, the um, dimension of a certain material conflict and competition between the Polish migrants, for example, to places like the UK, um, versus the migrants from, from, for example, Muslim countries, a, a competition for jobs, etc., in a structural perspective. Also, in terms of a certain techniques of managing the working classes by dividing them according to a sort of identity conflicts or along the identity conflicts. Do you see this? Do you see this in any way important? Have you actually become interested into the sort of transmissions of different uh, notions, concepts, or statements in the context of uh, this uh, uh, Polish uh, uh, Islamophobic discourse? <laughs> Um, if I'd like to, oh, if I'd like to suggest that we actually collect a number of questions, and uh, uh, then Monica could respond to, to um, all those questions together. Well, let me reverse um, um, from a political angle because. Uh, you only touched on the year 2001, uh, that is 9-11 and uh, New York. But had we actually moved beyond 2001, and uh, speaking about uh, well, uh, the uh, Islam in Europe, we need to remember also the Balkan Wars, which are earlier, and the Chechen War. Uh, which were also material in Poland, and the images uh, that we see as a society. So it's not just the uh, New York Towers, but actually everything that uh, carries uh, the religious wars, um, the carriers of the religious wars in the 20th century, and images that are linked to them, the Balkan Wars as well as the Chechen Wars, were religious wars. And uh, it was then that for the first time the um, uh, Islam is uh, uh, seen as an um, enemy of our European religion, be it uh, Catholic or Orthodox. Um, so within the modern Islamophobia, what is the role of uh, this collective image and that is uh, transferred by TV then internet? Uh, how much uh, deeply anchored is it or rooted is it in our collective awareness? Um, and uh, translate into social uh, threats. Uh, Monica, if you could really now respond to those two questions, and then we will invite uh, further questions or comments. Well, my response. Well, the question is, when a social conflict or war is uh, coded as religious and when it's not um, viewed as religious. What we uh, look at when in the presence of Chechen refugees in Poland, when they arrived in Poland, uh, they were not codified, so to say, as Muslims. Um, that thinking wasn't present. So um, the question is, when a war becomes a religious war, when religion becomes an um, idiom uh, of a uh, narrative for a social conflict, tragedy, or violence. Uh, 
So um, for me, it's not that obvious. We need to pose a question when religion and for what reason a religion becomes a useful discourse. Because I do have the sense, the feeling that oftentimes narrowing, narrowing down a conflict or a war to religion and trying to explain it via religion is a process of depoliticizing a conflict when a conflict is reduced to some religious principle. It's a form of depoliticization, which is also uh, recognized um, in their attitude to Islamic terrorism when violence is explained through a religious DNA uh, part and parcel of the Quran. And the whole phenomena becomes, uh, just boils down to uh, some religious uh, principle, depoliticized. We then no longer need to think about the complex social political dynamics uh, that um, are the background to certain acts. So it's like an um, ideological curtain, if you will, uh, that we try to um, reduce uh, historic facts, uh, wars, and just a religious dimension. And I do see this as a problem. And matters pertaining to Islamophobia, Polish Islamophobia in the UK. You cannot marginalize uh, this aspect of uh, um, of, um, strategy of assimilation, that this is a strategy of assimilation, the minorities, like the Polish diaspora, uh, by using uh, the Islamophobic language, oftentimes uh, being uh, a group of immigrants who are just recent arrivals, if you will, um, who in juxtaposition to people who've been there for s generations try to underscore their Christianity. Uh, it's a way or an attempt uh, to assimilate into what is Christian and white. Uh, those who are to be others, Muslims, non-white. So it's um, a strategy of uh, becoming part of an existing society, but of course it doesn't work. So it is a certain outcome of um, the dynamics of being a minority, trying to find your place in the social order. And in a way, also uh, connected uh, to uh, the situation on the labor market. Mm, uh, empirically, I have not researched this uh, uh, topic, but I do know that a number of such research projects are ongoing with respect to the Polish diaspora and Islamophobia. And I do believe that quite soon we can expect some um, results of that research. Uh, uh, so I do raise this because I'm not able right now to uh, refer to some uh, tangible or specific uh, sociological data, but this is a phenomenon that is ongoing. And uh, a group of uh, researchers uh, in the UK, and I know they are dealing with this uh, topic, and I believe that soon we'll be able to know more about this. Uh, I think I am the only Muslim in the room, and I cannot really fail not to ask some questions. I do apologize for my poor um, knowledge of Polish, but I would want to ask about definitions, uh, uh, because sometimes you bring Islam to gender, and can you, for example, uh, give uh, some definition of this Polish-specific Islamophobia? And uh, uh, so, uh, as you said, uh, uh, Islamophobia with no Muslims. And what are the statistics? How many Poles have converted to Islam? And from a historical perspective, Islamophobia is not such a new phenomena. Uh, you can also find the text of a Christian theologian. John of Damascus, that what is also um, spoken about Islam as heresy was already 
well, words used in that text. So even at those times, uh, there was this uh, train of thinking. So maybe uh, this is all that I would wanted to really underscore. Thank you. Well, um, without a doubt, uh, the word uh, Islam without mm, Islamophobia without Muslims, well, it's um, detrimental and uh, hurtful, and uh, it overlooks something very important. Namely, it overlooks a fact that even though uh, the uh, Muslim community in Poland is statistically a very small one, uh, what I think is of interest is to what extent its uh, numbers are exaggerated in the sort of general uh, um, belief. Uh, so this was also quite uh, evident from a survey that was made a few years where Europeans exaggerated to considerably the number of uh, the Muslim minority in Europe. In Poland, uh, the uh, exaggeration of those actual numbers was uh, the uh, biggest. Sometimes it was even a hundred times um, uh, overestimated in terms of the perception of uh, Poles in terms of uh, the number of Muslims in Poland. Uh, some say uh, it's um, um, tens, uh, some say 30,000 Muslims, uh, but in general perception, as shown in the survey, they thought it was uh, millions of Muslims, uh, a million of Muslims in Poland. So uh, while this community is, uh, in terms of numbers, quite small, but it feels uh, the um, uh, hostility and um, reluctance. Uh, so um, this word, the slogan, Islamophobia without Muslims, uh, it shows uh, that it's an inadequate uh, term because there are uh, people who suffer um, uh, uh, this dislike and attack. So that's why I question uh, this particular uh, term. But nonetheless, one needs to keep this in mind. But I spoke about um, a relatively recent history of Islamophobia as um, um, public uh, uh, phenomena when Islamophobia became articulated and became a political uh, vehicle. And of course, this is recent history, uh, um, putting, uh, making this part and parcel of uh, current uh, policies. So this is quite a recent phenomena. But if you were to look at the long history of attitude of Europeans or Christians to Muslims, obviously, yes, in the various narratives, there are hostile uh, narratives, distancing Christians from Muslims, and there are numerous. Of course, you're speaking about it, such uh, historical examples. But what is interesting to me is that, uh, historically speaking, uh, Europeans or Christians oftentimes um, uh, bunched uh, Muslims and Jews together. Many of the um, stereotypes of uh, Muslims were a re reiteration of um, stereotypes uh, connected to Jews uh, that uh, uh, sort of um, the appearance of Muslim, of Islam, was in a way like um, in, in, in the uh, resurrection of uh, the lot of uh, Moses. So um, the, this was, uh, in a way, uh, sort of a reiteration of such attitude. So definitely, history goes back uh, much further. But when we speak about Islamophobia, I'm speaking here about the use of Islamophobia in public discourse, intertwining uh, in Islamophobia in a public discourse. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the perception of the past of uh, history is important, uh, but it is slightly different than what I had been referring. It had um, functioned somewhat differently in the past. In my book, I also have shown that uh, something which is very contemporarily strong, seeing uh, this huge antagonism between Christianity and Islam, that it's actually a modern construct. Some authors uh, even claim that this uh, very notion of the world of Islam uh, dates back only to the late 19th century, that we are simply automatically 
uh, imposing this present uh, conflict on, for example, medieval history that could not have been simply described in terms of a clash between Christianity and uh, um, Islam, that these uh, lines of division were much more complicated, and it's a huge anachronism that we're now imposing on the past. I have a question to what uh, effect or how much these uh, Muslim Christian relations are analogous or similar to other places. Uh, for example, the problem of assimilation of Catholics in the United States uh, that happened uh, in the past. Uh, I don't want to uh, propose this as a uh, symmetrical uh, argument, but for example, the problem of the Christian minority in Turkey. I'm sure that these um, groups uh, were seen uh, through their religion, despite the fact that they came from different types of Christian uh, confessions. We also had a similar thing with the Jews, right? Different uh, ethnic groups that were simply seen all as one due to their uh, religious affiliation. Well, it's a motive that is often touched on, the similarity of uh, anti-Muslim discourses, these motives that they are unable to assimilate, uh, that uh, there is a backwardness, uh, in essence, of these people, uh, misogyny, um, you know, uh, disrespect for uh, women's rights, uh, an ability to understand uh, the modern world, that these were elements uh, also of the anti-Catholic discourses in the United States. And it, the same motives are very um, well seen in the context of how Muslims are presented. Here, the Catholics were uh, apparently unable to assimilate and become true Americans, also due to their loyalty to the Pope which was obviously a uh, an outside uh, uh, political structure, that being the Catholic uh, um, Church. So these mo motives are repeated, that Catholics uh, should not be, uh, they're not trustworthy, if you will, that they will, they're, 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 they're never going to assimilate. These motives are uh, indeed quite similar, and uh, so is this element of uh, orientalizing the Catholics in the States. Uh, uh, Casanova, for example, uh, has produced such analyses. Um, and so this is quite similar to the Muslims in the European context. But what I also said before, the similarity that you uh, pointed to in perceiving of Jews and Muslims, in my book, I go back to the history of a category which today is uh, rather uh, um, delegitimized, namely a category of Semites that appeared at one point in time in uh, European linguistics in the late 18th century, and which was uh, first and foremost a category uh, from the field of linguistics, namely on the basis of interest in different uh, languages outside of uh, Europe, these languages were classified or and, and also similarities were noticed between Hebrew and Arabic and then they all became uh, Semitic languages and on the basis of these linguistic uh, um, sort of classifications, uh, uh, also races were classified with the inclusion of religious elements. When you read uh, the text by 17th, 18th century linguists, it is uh, difficult to separate uh, the uh, linguistics from what we'd call raciology and uh, religion and the specificities of the Semitic languages which uh, uh, are the basis uh, for the uh, specificities uh, of the different uh, Semitic races and Arabs all of a sudden uh, are becoming this, uh, these paradigmatic uh, uh, Muslims. Uh, uh, coupled with uh, Jews, who are also Semites, Judaism is, begin, is, be, is, is, is then seen as a religion which has uh, very many similarities to Islam, and it has many similarities to Islam. And uh, this uh, whole, you know, all the racial affiliations uh, 
Arabs, Jews, Semites, etc., all of this became very much uh, sort of uh, dropped into the same melting pot. Semites uh, were supposed to be in opposition to the Aryans. Semites were supposed to be uh, very much in opposition to what was European and Aryan. Of course, this discourse was uh, later uh, taken up by the Nazis, and this Aryan um, race uh, was supposedly superior to Semitic, but I'm talking about this category of Semitic because this was an instrument of associated, uh, of associated um, you know, what was Jewish was associated with the Arabic, and all of this was put under this sort of uh, same umbrella. Of course, uh, many things have happened uh, since the late 19th century. Uh, the 20th century was like a trajectory that sort of splits up or bifurcates or yeah, divides the Arabs from the Jews uh, for political and historical reasons. It's a complicated story, but true enough, based on the European culture, uh, this uh, category of uh, Semitism uh, did uh, contain both of these groups and uh, um, sort of also combine them also to make them different or strange from what was European and Christian. It was also to accentuate the inferiority of the separate groups. So this was a, a history of alienating the separate groups that was used to define the European, the Christian, the progressive, the Western. I have uh, a doubt. About the role of the media, maybe in uh, forming or shaping these stereotypes which uh, serve as the foundation of Islamophobia. And also against uh, to this uh, classical orientalistic uh, uh, view of uh, the East as something that doesn't change and that should be corrected from the outside, that it's like a dragon or a monster. Ziaul Haq, for example, was such a dragon. Was the mid 1970s, was it not? When he overthrew Ali Bhutto, who was the Islamic monster, the first. Then we had Iran. It should be mentioned that at the beginning of the Iran Iraqi war, Iraq was supported by all the powers of the world so as to um, fight uh, Iran. And why did I mention the media? If I remember correctly, both the Balkan War and at least the first the Chechen War was not shown as a religious war at all, and it was not actually a religious war. The first act of religiousness uh, in the war of the Caucasus was the atrocious attack in Beslan, which was absolutely irrational in the whole course of this war. And if I also make a digression which is a little nasty, the Saint John of Damascus would not have said all those nasty things if he, he had not been uh, let uh, or sort of dismissed from his uh, job because he was a Christian working for the Caliphate and he was fired. So this is why he kind of had his thing with the. Monica, thank you very much for your lecture and also thank you for this very systematical and political um, elaboration of Islamophobia. It's a very uh, much needed book uh, and so is this perspective very much needed which would include this entire project of fear and racism, racism and fear of people who are projected as having anything to do with Islam, that you've actually looked at it in a systemic uh, manner. 
Now my question is the following. I don't know the book uh, yet. I've only read some fragments, but I've only just pretty much skimmed it. So maybe the answer to my question is in the book, but nevertheless, I would like to ask it. It's about resistance, because um, you are sort of uh, entering the uh, narrative of uh, Foucault. Uh, and as he claimed, all forms of uh, resistance or control of resistance. Man, this is going to be a complicated question, but I hope I can uh, I can sort of articulate it. Okay. Just as uh, Spivak was accused of the fact that her idea, his idea on erasing the other limited the effic the agency, the description and the visibility of the subordinate other. I'm thinking about what is happening to those who actually are Muslims or who come from areas that are identified with uh, such religions as part of the narratives that focus on the structures of authority of power. I understand that it is not your intention and your project is not directly leading to the conclusion conclusion about the erasure or deletion of the other, but my question is, so how do you see the possibilities of resistance and how they have influenced your story about Islamophobia as a technology of power? And I don't really want to ask whether we have hope in our fight against fascism, but okay, so let me throw this package of questions at you. And I'm very much impressed both by what you've written but also by what you've said. Yes, and if you could please now respond to both of these questions. <laughs> um, yeah. My perspective in this book uh, is pessimistic because the more, uh, the deeper I went into the roots, into the analysis of the roots of Islamophobia, the more I've uh, noticed that they're very deep and that we are reproduced so many things and that there are, there's different areas uh, with which I have a problem as a feminist, how to approach Islam being a feminist. And um, it, it turns out, to, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to talk about everything. You have to talk about the economic reality. You have to talk about the language in which we use to express our emancipatory projects. There's also the question of the nationalist wave um, and, and the fact that it's also a part of this whole jigsaw. And at the end of the day, you get a landscape which is very gloomy in which uh, um, Islamophobia is very much inscribed, very much a part of the constitutive elements uh, of the European reality, of the, of the European values, practices, reactions. And all of a sudden, it, it becomes a very complicated project. Contesting Islamophobia actually requires the, a reinvention of re Europeanness, a Europeanness that would not be in contradiction to Islam. Reinvention of an emancipatory language, be it a feminist language, <coughs> that would not reproduce, automatically reproduce orientalistic narratives, anti-orientalistic narratives, and that would not contribute to the stigmatization of uh, uh, Muslim communities. And that is happening. The paradigmatic figure uh, in the realm of feminism or the queer uh, theory is Judith Butler, for example, who refuses to instrumentalize her voice, her uh, voice uh, to be used in anti-Muslim policy. That is a problem, of course. Then how do we think about the uh, about an emancipatory project? I mean, what do we do with religion in this case? So all these things, they come, they, they kind of, uh, uh, Contesting Islamophobia is not merely about opposing a nationalist violence out on the street, uh, the victims of which are people who are associated with Islam. It is, it is becoming a political project, a huge political project that actually, and as I have also mentioned, because this is something that I'm also interested in, requires a revision of the knowledge about Islam. And the more I read, 
into the different ways of a uh, more sort of permanent representation of uh, Islamic presence, the more I see it. But if you ask me about specific uh, examples, in the book I read about uh, Islamic feminism, too, which I think is a very um, interesting philosophical project, too, in effect, <coughs> which is not also a devoid of a political risk. It is a project which is happening. It is interesting uh, politically because it tries to combine an egalitarian, emancipatory attitude also connected with resistance to some kind of a redefinition of Islam. You could say that this is utopian, and in the face of the um, force uh, of the uh, religious uh, institutions that are patriarchic and are very much against feminism, that this uh, uh, effort uh, seems also suicidal. But it is happening, and I think that it does uh, sort of uh, uh, transgress the um, orientalistic uh, schemes. It's a search for new categories, new forms of mobilizations, new alliances, if you will that this is a space uh, where something new can actually be generated. And uh, for that reason, I don't really know what to tell you, except uh, for the fact that it's a project that needs to be extremely uh, broad and very interesting indeed, and that this um, opposing uh, of Islamophobia, yeah, right. Well, we need to look for a new order. We need to uh, look for a new imaginarium that could be the foundation for a new Europeanness, with the inclusion of issues from the realm of uh, the economy, uh, rethink issues of history, knowledge, emancipatory thought. And then we could just move in trying to enter ever new tropes, but this is what the landscape looks like, more or less. Ad media. Uh, the media did also play a role in building the image of this uh, Islamic monster. Well, as you said before, uh, it sort of uh, reaffirms my uh, observations that only at a certain point in time uh, some uh, conflicts uh, had uh, acquired uh, this religious uh, definition. Of course, you can think about the revolution in Iran and how that was treated by the media. But uh, um, and yes, uh, the media uh, sort of impose a certain structure in our imagination of social order. So the process that I was uh, describing, this is sort of trying to come up with the Muslim story, um, uh, is uh, through, in a way, intermediate by the media, the developments uh, that were uh, very um, strongly covered in the media uh, also played an important role. Those categories had uh, uh, grown into this uh, uh, category of Muslim uh, uh, as a uh, identity sort of uh, benchmark, uh, all was generated by the media. Well, so it's not just a, a question of a st stigma. Um, uh, stigmatizing uh, specific groups as Muslim, uh, but also um, their self-understanding or, or sort of a self-stigmatization, if you will. Uh, well, in my book, I uh, depict this, uh, that it's a process. Uh, it's a, a process that has at least uh, two sides to it. On the one hand, Muslims um, have become uh, to be stigmatized as Muslims, but uh, Muslimness uh, had become a sort of a, um, um, a form of identification. Um, um, that's why I quoted the girls in France uh, who were wearing scarves. Um, and in many cases, uh, these girls uh, were not really uh, following a certain family tradition. They were not forced into wearing the hijab because of a family tradition, but it was a very individualistic act of uh, uh, expression uh, identification with a certain group uh, which had many traits of a rebellion and uh, so uh, one could interpret this uh, as a way of affirming the identity of the excluded um, in um, a society that does not fulfill the promise of uh, this uh, um, uh, empowerment or emancipation. So on the one hand, uh, the uh, Muslims stigmatize as Muslims, and on the other uh, flip side, uh, uh, Muslimness as a category of identity and uh, political 
uh, mobilization and uh, building of um, sort of a, a separate uh, um, uh, minority and affirm it, uh, uh, affirmation of that minority. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we should uh, and gradually wrap up our meeting. So if there's any further final questions or comments uh, that you'd like to share, I do indicate your interest. And if not, uh, I see at the back of the room uh, there is a question. I do hope that you will forgive me for uh, still speaking about uh, this uh, strategy of resistance uh, that was raised in the previous question. We was stated that we need to build some new project and review our assumptions, and this is quite obvious for people in this room and also for the feminists from uh, the uh, Congress of Women, uh, Magdalena Shiroda, that they could be convinced to, to this. Uh, but we are confronted, in fact, uh, with uh, a wall uh, who will be not influenced by why we say these people will have no interest in uh, the emancipatory project, uh, even in a society uh, that in nominal terms is a Catholic. Um, I'm here speaking really more of a Poland. Uh, still, the voice of the episcopate is quite clear that we need to accept uh, 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 the refugees and the display uh, Christian mercy, uh, but uh, the Polish Christians in mass uh, are moved by this appeal of the church. So. How can we address this? What can we do about this? So I, till now, have not had a good answer to this, and I don't know whether something new can be constructed. What can we do um, in a um, sense of our um, the sort of um, daily political practice? <laughs> what to do, yes. Well, uh, the question that you raise doesn't really apply only to Islamophobia in reality. It's really. Um, my broader question about uh, the condition of the world uh, in which we function right now, in which we live, and uh, conditions which various xenophobias uh, are nurtured and uh, grow. Uh, so it's a much broader question. In terms of religious aspects, uh, this is also interesting how Polish Catholicism responds uh, to um, topics related to refugees, uh, immigrants, or attitude to Islam. So we do see that there's um, internal polarization, um, the religious grounds on the one hand, uh, this narrative uh, stressing uh, the order of mercy, which was so much focused uh, in 2016 that first we need to take care of the Christians and not the Muslims. And then, so this Catholicism, if uh, you will, is uh, like uh, the mark of uh, a tribal belonging and not a universal religion. And uh, so, of course, we are dealing with that as well. And, uh, if, well, I always feel somehow helpless where somebody expects from me a project uh, uh, of a political uh, mobilization that will change the world. I really see certain uh, points of action that can be taken that I am interested in, where I can really uh, uh, make some thing, do something that is meaningful. Uh, I mean, no, I'm trying to um, avoid uh, such some global s sweeping answers, and possibly I could revert the question to people in the room, and possibly you can all uh, try to propose something in terms of how we respond. I'd like to ask another question. Well, mm, I'm thinking uh, that well, something happened in public discourse that uh, religious identity has become so uh, meaningful. And this happened in the same 1980s when uh, before Reagan and Thatcher took uh, power, uh, there were two other, let's say, uh, shock waves that also um, broke the business as usual, of the, that is the two um, oil crises and uh, the uh, OPEC price collusion, and the second, the Iranian revolution. So I'm really wondering, to what extent do you think that this change in discourse was really 
uh, the outcome of sort of trying to digest this in an intellectual terms so because this all um, happened at the rush the uh, uh, scandal the scarves and uh, it's now been 20 years uh, since then and Huntington uh, who was one of the advisors uh, a security advisor to uh, Carter uh, had published his article on the clash of civilizations and uh, um, a discussion that is really ongoing till today and uh, the second question is to what extent was this related to changes in the understanding of um, the uh, Middle East societies themselves and uh, Kaba who's uh, saying that it's a backlash uh, to uh, the stepped up modernization of uh, the 70s and 80s. Uh, the facts that you quote from the 1970s, they are material in a geopolitical drama, if you will. Um, they had their, they were meaningful in terms of building the relations with the so-called world of Islam. But the um, political conflict did not translate yet directly into a public discourse. And this um, heightened uh, um, anti-Muslim xenophobia. Um, when I write about Huntington, and Huntington delivered this strong narrative, his um, clash of civilizations. Uh, well, in his book, he doesn't really present a vision of um, the West versus Islam. Uh, his vision is more complex, uh, but in a sort of a pop type of uh, assimilation of uh, the Huntington slogans bring it down to a binary clash between Islam and the West. Uh, uh, Huntington delivered a certain language, a sort of popular language of uh, speaking about developments in the world. But I always really stress that what is the function of Huntington's narrative? Who is he? He creates a um, a language of describing geopolitical situations, and one could claim that his tale, in a way, his narrative, replaces the Cold War, Manichaean type of binary approach to the world. And now we replace this with the world of Islam. And one could think to what extent the Huntington narrative replaces this Cold War narrative. But for me, Huntington brings also something else which is important. Huntington is really an American nationalist and a conservatist who speaks about a clash of civilizations and the need to defend one's own um, civilizational identity in order to uh, mobilize own societies uh, to well, he's an opponent to multiculturalism, feminism, a proponent of a conservative um, model of society where minorities well really have very little to say. Huntington is an author of the known text from the 1970s where he uh, and depicts about this empowerment of different minorities. And he is foremost of a conservative and nationalist. And one ought to remember that this language of a clash with alien civilizations, uh, the civilizations of others, including Islam, is also this internal attempt to conservative uh, the, uh, to preserve the conservative vision of society. And uh, so uh, this image of uh, uh, conflict with Islam it has um, an internal political function to stabilize uh, the uh, conservative definition of a community so that it mobilizes uh, to fight this external threat. This external threat is serving uh, to uh, ensure that this conservative vision of society is anchored, it's uh, strengthened. So I feel that this is really important, that building this Islamic threat uh, uh, serves this purpose, uh, serves a 
in the internal uh, domestic policy. And Huntington also was interested in the state of morality in society, um, uh, pregnancy among uh, uh, minors. And this is a part, of, part and how the, um, if the society mobilizes to fight Islam, this will be a return to the healthy um, you know, Anglo-Saxon Protestant values. So these are correlated. Uh, so that's how it works. I don't know what they managed to answer your um, question. Fortunately, the speaker is not using a microphone. Well, the question, the other part of the question was, um, what I try to uh, uh, show a certain Western context uh, where the culturalization of a public discourse, this. Uh, obsessive focus on the uh, cultural, religious uh, belonging, uh, thinking not in class, economic terms, or social justice terms, but as belonging to a cultural uh, religion. And uh, this is the outcome of a neoliberal policies, the crisis of uh, the left-wing narrative, which could really be placed in the, let's say, uh, 1980s, late 1980s, and even more pronounced in the 1990s. But do notice that the Muslim communities do not live in a separate world. So if we were to look at uh, um, the degree of popularity of religious-based language and the, um, Islam becoming a political narrative, and this is also an outcome, a product of uh, the crisis of uh, the secular uh, narrative of crises. Uh, so um, this uh, reinforcement, uh, very great reinforcement, uh, when in Muslim societies, uh, the earlier uh, uh, the colonialism, nationalistic narrative, uh, the so-called um, um, modernistic uh, link to socialist ideals, uh, go through a crisis period, and uh, they are crowded out by a politicized Islam. So this process is really part of the same jigsaw puzzle uh, that we're talking about, uh, this culturalization of a public discord in the West. Why should it be another puzzle? It's the same. So it's uh, this uh, crisis of delay, secular narrative, and uh, uh, emancipatory or political uh, discourse um, bears the fruit of uh, um, uh, religion and identity um, coming into politics. And I do believe that in this sense, of course, uh, the uh, landscape uh, of political conditions is uh, quite complex, but this politicized religion in this Islamic uh, version uh, also becomes part of this landscape. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Monica um, for her lecture. Um, I'd like to thank her for her lecture and her discourse.